Hello, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful program with Natasha Lester and Carrie Marr. We're very excited to have them here. My name is Mina Jane. I am um, one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library in Lexington, Massachusetts. I know we're all over the world right now because Carrie is from my, my neck of the woods here and Natasha is all the way across the country world in Australia. So um, I have to just say, tell you a few things before we get started. We are recording this and we are on Facebook Live um, stream. So if you, you can ask questions there or you can ask questions in the Q&A here in Zoom, use the chat for comments or for, um, for any tech issues, I'll be paying attention to that. Um, we have signed books by Natasha and Carrie at Porter Square Books. We're always happy to partner with them. And so if you would like to buy books by Carrie or Natasha, just um, go to the program description, which I will also send out in the recap. So you can buy books from them, um, from Porter Square Books. And they are signed by uh, Bookplate, although Carrie might actually meander over there. <laughs> I can go. <laughs> she'll wear a mask, she'll start a <laughs> That's right. And uh, we love having our local indie bookstores. Um, I'd like to thank the Penguin Random House team who has helped bring Natasha and Carrie here as well as forever. Is that correct, Natasha? Yeah. No, Carrie? Yeah. So um, these different imprints have really helped us bring this wonderful program to Lexington. I'd like to thank the Carrie Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programs. We could not do it without them. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of information about our authors. Natasha Lester is the award-winning author of several books. Um, the Age newspaper has described her as a remarkable Australian talent. She's been awarded the grants by the Australia Council for her work in writing residencies from Varuna, the Writer's House, and the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Writer's Center. She loves teaching writing courses, and when she's not working on her novels or teaching others how to write, she can usually be found reading, going to yoga, or playing dress up with her three children. She lives in Western Australia. Carrie Marr is also the, is the author of, this is not a writing manual, notes from the young writer in the real world under a, her name, Carrie Majors. Um, she holds an MFA from the Columbia University and, and founded YARN, an award-winning literary journal of short form writing, YA writing. For many years, a professor of writing, she now, she now writes full-time and lives with her daughter in Massachusetts where apple picking and long walks in the woods are especially fine. And if you live locally, you know that that's absolutely true. Um, what I wanted to say about Natasha and um, Carrie's books is that um, the words that people describe your books in, um, in, you know, in your blurbs and your uh, reviews are things like gorgeous and rich and detailed and emotional and dazzling and stunning. And um, I just think that's fa fantastic. I think that you, the, wor the words that you put to paper are ones that have meaning for so many of us. So um, thank you for that. Um, so we're just gonna it's get- It's nice, people who say those things, there are probably plenty of other adjectives that people use wow. for my <laughs> books as well. <laughs> we won't read those ones out though. <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're only doing the good stuff right now. <laughs> I actually, I did a little research here and I did not find anybody that said they didn't like your books. Um, either okay. way, so yeah, I mean, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just um, start off with a question about, um, about your books. If you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your latest book, um, The Paris Secret and um, <laughs> what else? <laughs> the Girl in the White Gloves, which is the both amazing, amazing, amazing books. But um, Carrie's book just came out a few days ago, right? No. Natasha's. Natasha's book came out just a few days ago. So yeah, a couple uh, of weeks now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's right. We were going to do a book birthday, but it didn't work out. <laughs> but yes, um, both books are fantastic, especially if you love historical fiction. And so um, my question to you is, uh, first of all, how did you pick your time periods? I know that um, they're wildly sort of different, but also sort of the same, you know, 1920s, World War II. Um, no, that's not true. Carrie, yours are, the White Gloves is about Grace Kelly, which is amazing. Um, so how did you pick your time periods? How did you pick your topic? And um, the third question that I, that I have is how, how hard is it to write about a real event? That probably goes to care. Like a real person, is it much harder because they, they actually are known to people? 
So I'm going to turn my video off, but I'll be um, placing in questions as you guys talk. Okay. <laughs> Great. Natasha, why don't you go first? Okay, sure. So um, the book I'm talking about today is The Paris Secret. So just to quickly, I guess, summarize what the book is about so that the answer to the question actually makes some sense. Um, the book is about a young woman called Kat who stumbles upon um, a collection of haute couture Christian Dior gowns hiding in a wardrobe in her grandmother's abandoned cottage in Cornwall. There's 65 gowns in total, one for each year dating back to Dior's very first collection in 1947, right through to the present day. And Kat wants to find out how her grandmother has come by such an amazing collection of Dior gowns. And so her investigations lead Kat back to discover a connection between her grandmother and Dior's very first showing in Paris in 1947, and also a connection between her grandmother and Christian Dior's sister, Catherine Dior, who fought for the French resistance during the Second World War. There's also another strange connection between her grandmother and a group of female pilots who flew planes during the Second World War. And as Kat uncovers all of these connections that she previously knew nothing about, she begins to realize that maybe she doesn't know her beloved grandmother as well as she thought she did. And so she has to decide whether or not she should keep searching or whether she should leave the past well enough alone. So that's pretty much a quick summary of what the book is about. In terms of um, Mina's questions, uh, how did I choose the time period to set the book in? I think that is kind of determined by the characters that I wanted to write about, which is where I think I came to the book first. And I imagine that's going to be the, pretty much the same for you too, Kerry, that the, the choice of subject drives the, the time period. So for me, um, and this also connects to another question Mina asked about writing about real people. The impetus behind writing about the Paris secret initially was that I discovered um, the story of Catherine Dior, so Christian Dior's sister, who I had never heard of. Obviously, everybody's heard of Christian Dior, the famous couturier, but his sister worked for the French resistance during the Second World War. Um, and her work um, for the resistance was so, such a thorn in the Nazis' side that they eventually um, tracked her down, captured her and sent her to Ravensbrück concentration camp, a concentration camp just for women. Um, she suffered terribly at the camp, but she was very lucky to escape from the camp in April 1945 and she made her way back to France barely alive and never spoke about her ex wartime experiences after that. And I couldn't believe that here was this amazing woman who had literally risked her life in the fight for freedom, who'd been completely forgotten by history. You know, her brother who makes dresses was well known by everybody, but Catherine, whose work was arguably more important, had been, you know, left behind somewhere. So I wanted to kind of bring her back to people's notice because for me, she's a true kind of heroine. And the same with the group of female pilots that I write about in the book. Sky, the main character in the historical storyline, works for the Air Transport Auxiliary in the Second World War, um, flying airplanes around England and was incredibly dangerous work and work that the women had to fight for the right to be able to do because women pilots were seen to be very transgressive in the 1940s. So it was really the wanting to write about those female pilots and wanting to write about Catherine Dior that drove the fact that this was going to be a book set largely over the Second World War period and just after the Second World War into 1947 when Dior's um, gowns were first shown. Um, and those real life kind of inspirations really drove that story as well. So that's pretty much mine in a nutshell. Um, Kerry, how about you? I imagine the deciding to write about Grace Kelly kind of drove the time period for you as well in a way. <laughs> yeah, well, 100%. I would say, you know, both of us um, write, I mean, I first of all, I read Natasha's book and like, you just cannot do better this this fall than, than reading The Paris Secret. It's a beautifully written book. And I mean, like hearing you describe it again, reminds me of reading the jacket flap i'm like all of this is gonna go to get come together and it does it comes together so beautifully like like a dior gown so um and so you know and obviously grace kelly wore dior yes 
Um, I know. She certainly <laughs> did. But she's she's more famous for um, being dressed by uh, um, Edith Head, you know, the yeah. great uh, uh, 1950s uh, Hollywood costume designer. And also um, something I didn't even know about her until I started doing my research is that she, um, one of her most serious boyfriends before she married the Prince of Monaco was Oleg Cassini. I, I didn't know that either. And I read it in your book and I was like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. So I loved that part of it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> And but and Oleg is more famous for dressing um, Jackie uh, Kennedy yeah. and then Onassis. But um, early in earlier in his career, he certainly dressed Grace, um, and uh, they had a very serious relationship for um, a good long while. Where she when she was a young single girl in um, New York City. So um, so some interesting fun sort of fashion overlaps between our subjects. <laughs> um, but my uh, my timeline kind of picks up where yours leaves off. Um, mm. Uh, so my, my uh, um, book covers the time period from 1949, so just after the Second World, end of the Second World War, um, all the way up until the uh, early 80s. Um, um, but with a, with a real focus on her 1950s um, film career. Um, and it's just as you said, Natasha, I was drawn to the time period through Grace Kelly. And of course, Grace Kelly, much like, you know, these, these fighter pilots and everything, she, she defined her era, right? Like those, we think of the dresses she wore, you know, the, the, you know, those ballet neck dresses with the like beautiful, you know, skirts. I mean, everyone is Googling her right now, right? Like trying to find a picture <laughs> of her, um, but you know, like she, those dresses and things that she wore really did define what a fifties lady looked like. Um, but that was actually not the reason I was attracted to her. Um, there were two, so one reason I was attracted to her was my mom was a huge Alfred Hitchcock fan. And so I watched Rear Window and To Catch a Thief um, very early in my life and many times. And I was sort of left with this sense of Grace Kelly being this amazingly talented actress who had only made movies in the 1950s and never later. And I kind of wondered why that would be. Um, and the other thing I kind of wondered about her was what, like, I knew that she had married this European prince, um, and but she was an American girl. And I was like, well, what was it like for this American girl to marry European royalty and live in, you know, the rest of her life in Europe? Um, and, you know, just with those two questions, my like novelist brain kicked in and I thought, well, let's, let's do some digging. Um, and, you know, it didn't take me long to realize that she was even more interesting than those two questions suggested. So I was really, it was, it was exciting to do the research on her. Mm. I couldn't believe that um, she basically married Prince Rainier after only having a letter correspondence. I mean, she met him, was it once or something like that? And then they wrote letters to each other for such a long time in your book. And then they decided to get married. I'm like, oh my God, no, Grace. At that point, I wanted to reach into the book and say, no, <laughs> stop. <laughs> yeah, well, so the letters, I love putting letters in my, in my, um, in my novels, um, but the, the, so the fact, the existence of those letters is true. They courted okay. in letters. Um, and I have to imagine it started with a thank you note as, yes. as mine did. Um, and, and, but you're right. They basically met on a press junket when she was at the Cannes Film Festival. They began this correspondence and um, like their second like live in-person meeting slash date was Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you, with the family no less it was <laughs> like <everybody. laughs> right I know it's really it's really incredible <clears throat> anyway yeah. but let's go back to the Paris secret because I wonder if you could talk a little bit um uh Natasha because I was so amazed by how much research you did and anyone who follows you on Instagram is, is in for a total treat because you you put these beautiful pictures of these Dior gowns that you 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 have your character cat wear in the course of the novel. So um, how did you unearth all that information? Tell us about that. Actually, sure. can, I, can I share for one second? Oh, sure. Um, on Facebook, Tracy says that when Natasha shows examples of Dior gowns, she can actually picture Grace Kelly in some of them. <laughs> Yes, there you go. for sure. And Grace <laughs> Kelly probably did wear some of them as well because she had a bit of a love affair with Dior too. So, um, yes, yeah, so the research part of um, writing The Paris Secret was actually super fun because at that time, 
international travel was still an option. And so I was able to kind of, you know, travel the world in the footsteps of my characters, which I always like to do. I do that for every book. So for this one, there are a number of different aspects that I wanted to research. Um, for me, it was really important that this mystery wardrobe of gowns that Kat discovers were all based on actual Dior gowns. I didn't want to invent anything. So I had to go in search of these gowns. And luckily 2017, the year I was researching the book was basically the year of Dior as far as museum exhibitions went. There was an amazing exhibition here in Australia in a gallery in Melbourne um, with 70 years of Dior gowns for me to go and you know, stare at with my mouth hanging open and take lots of photos from. So I, I picked quite a few out there. And then I went across to Paris and the Musée des Arts Décoratifs had that amazing Couturier de Rêve or Designer of Dreams exhibition on at the time with uh, tons more amazing gowns for me to kind of covet and drool over. But in that exhibition, really interestingly, because um, I was also looking for evidence of Catherine and her life. And Catherine Dior was probably the hardest person I've ever researched because there's very little evidence of her in any kind of written form. Christian mentions her maybe two or three times in his autobiography, but it's one sentence is it's not nothing in detail. Catherine didn't write anything down about her experiences. Um, but in the middle of this exhibition in Paris between gowns, there was this uh, copy of a handwritten letter from Christian to his father written in April 1945, saying that he just heard that Catherine had been released or escaped. He wasn't sure from this camp that she had been imprisoned in and that she was making her way back across to France with a couple of friends and he was going to meet her at the border and bring her safely home. And that was literally the first piece of actual evidence that I'd seen about Catherine. And so it was this really wonderful research moment for me as a writer to say, okay, well, she really did exist and this really did happen to her because here is this, you know, a letter written by Christian. So while you know, everybody's looking at the gowns, I'm, you know, madly taking photographs of this letter. Um, I also went up to Grandville in France, which is where the ex Dior family home is. And that's now been turned into a museum dedicated to the Dior's, but obviously largely Christian. Uh, and they had some childhood photographs of Catherine and I was able to see, you know, where her bedroom was in the house. Um, but again, you know, that was sort of her childhood, nothing really about her adulthood. So um, I did have to make quite a bit up in relation to Catherine, which I don't like to do, but I used as much evidence as I could to really fill in the gaps, which I think we always have to do as writers writing about real people. Um, the female pilots were much easier to write about because many of them wrote their memoirs. And that was amazing for me because I was able to read about all of their experiences, you know, fighting against the patriarchy of the RAF, because there's probably not a, not a more male organization that would have existed in England at the time who were, you know, basically doing their damnedest to make sure these women didn't set foot inside their planes. Um, and thankfully these women pushed back and they did, and they wrote all of that down in their memoirs. And so I was scouring secondhand bookshops online, purchasing copies of those so I could read about the women's actual first-hand experiences. And I used much, a lot, many of the um, incidents that Sky faces in the book are based on those examples that I picked up in those memoirs that I read. Um, so yeah, so lots of, and I went to England as well and, um, you know, went to uh, museums with uh, old Spitfires and aeroplanes in them because I know nothing about flying and I didn't want to read a, a manual about flight because that would have literally put me to sleep. So for me, the best way to learn is to sit in the cockpit of a Spitfire and feel how small it is and, you know, see all the instruments and visualise it and take lots of photographs that way. So, so it was lots of fun researching, but I imagine much the same for you. I was really keen to know how you researched Grace because the first thing is that opening scene where Grace is on holidays with her sister and she has that photographer come in to right. take those photographs of her. And I had never seen those photographs. As soon as I read that scene, I was on the iPad Googling, bringing up those images and they are beautiful yeah. because normally you see Grace in her beautiful gown, full face of makeup. And these are just much more spontaneous and natural feeling and quite unlike the normal photographs we see of her. So, so tell yeah. us a bit about that scene and your other research that you did too. Yeah, well, and, and you were touching also on, I think Mina asked us about writing about real people. And, and so you have like a combination in your book. And so yes. 
So, you know, with Grace Kelly, I've now written about two, two real people. My first novel was The Kennedy Debutante, which is about John F. Kennedy's um, younger sister, Kathleen Kennedy, um, for whom there was much more primary source material. Like her scrapbooks and diaries and stuff are all at the um, John F. Kennedy Library. I'm not going to dwell on that, but th th I just want to say that that's a huge contrast to writing about Grace Kelly because there is hardly any primary source material like letters, diaries. As far as I know, she didn't keep a diary. Um, in the public domain, I wrote to many historical societies and museums. I mean, even museums who have done, you know, exhibitions on her, you know, they some of them were like loaned, but they couldn't give me information on who they were loaned from. And, you know, so it was really hard to find information. So I wound up having to read a number of biographies. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a wide range for someone like Grace, you know, from being very salacious to the, you know, um, you know, one of the most, I would say the two most useful biographies, um, one of them, um, one of them was by Donald Spotto, who's actually most famous for writing about Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and, but he also wrote this really nice, um, but it's much smaller, than his Alfred Hitchcock tome, it's like a doorstop. Um, he wrote about Grace Kelly and really focused on just her film career, like not her personal life. He just touched on her personal life. And so he, and he's a real like film insider, really understood film and obviously loves Alfred Hitchcock. So that was super useful for me in learning about her film career. And then another really useful, um, it's, it's sort of a biography memoir hybrid. It's written by one of her bridesmaids by, oh. um, her name is Judith Balaban Quine. And she was one of the bridesmaids. And in fact, the book is called The Bridesmaids and it was published in the eighties. Um, and it's very much a memoir from Judith's perspective, a memory of the wedding and everything. Um, but it's also like, a, very much also like a, a, a friend's biography of grace. Um, but at the same time, it's a, it was such a useful um, kind of thinking about, uh, Judith really thinks a lot out loud about what it was like to be a woman in the 1950s and 60s and kind of like the rules that governed their dating lives and, and all this other stuff. And, you know, one of the things that she talks about a lot is how little they really talked to each other about their, their personal lives, how that was, you know, that was, that is just, you know, when we think of, you know, girls getting together, like sex in the city, those, those, those brunches on Sunday morning where they would talk about their dates, like they just didn't do that. And so that left me, be, so between the fact that I, I knew then that Grace didn't like talk that much about herself and her personal life, and she didn't leave like a written record that gave me a lot of, like, it required me to really think about, um, how she must have felt about making certain movies or having certain relationships or um, there are a couple of you know famous things that happened with her um, her parents and her siblings and so what like so what did she what must she have thought about um, those things and I just tried to do my honest best um, I think when we're writing about real people I mean I'm sure you can talk to, about this too it's 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 hard because it's at some point you you are writing a novel, <laughs> um, and so you you have to feel comfortable taking the artistic liberty, um, knowing that you've done um, you know responsible research. So, I think uh, that's where that one is for me. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, it's really impossible to know what they were thinking and feeling. So if you are going to pull a real life person into a novel, you are obviously going to have to speculate and make those kinds of things up. Um, and, you know, we are writing fiction at the end of the day, as you say, yeah. although there are people out there who like to um, point out where we've strayed from the, from the fact. Yeah. <laughs> we love those. That's why we have the author's note. <laughs> right. <laughs> our friend, our mutual friend Kate Quinn, who wrote famously wrote the Alice Network. Um, I went to a, a panel that she did at a um, the Historical Novel Society, and she like in passing, she was like, "All hail the author's note." It's like <laughs> the place where we get to confess all of our sins. <laughs> and, and really talk about like you know the, like the if if there was ever a place where we needed to really depart from the historical record we would always account for it there. Um, yeah. Especially because people who really are, tr you know, true history buffs who have who probably read all the same books we read, you know, going into our research, they know. So, um, 
you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be, um, we no, want no, to I just, to the fact. It, it's funny though, isn't it? How we feel like we have to, you know, apologize in our author's notes for straying from the fact, even though it's fiction, <laughs> but, you know, being, wanting to be true to the facts, obviously yeah. drives that impulse, but it is kind of ironic in a way, I guess. It is, it is. <laughs> um, and, well, you Lena, know, are, go ahead. Are there any questions, Mena, Mena from uh, the audience? Was yeah, there any Actually, this is a good point, a spot for it too, because Tammy asks, how long did it take you to do the research for um, each of your books? And um, I actually have a, an adjunct to that, which is, um, are you a pants, a pantser or a planner? Oh. Um, so like once you've done your research, what do you do then? Okay, so in terms of how long the research takes, that's kind of hard to answer because I'm researching the whole time I'm writing. I know some writers do all of their research up front and then sit down and write the book, um, but this ties back into that whole plotter, pantser kind of question. I am a very organised person in every element of my life, except when it comes to writing. I have lists for everything, <laughs> But for writing, I don't know, that part of my brain that organises everything just goes, explodes and says, no, I can't do this. So I really sit down to write with the barest germ of an idea. And the first draft is terrifying because the entire time I'm thinking, oh, gosh, what if this doesn't work out? And halfway through, I realise I don't have enough or I don't know what to do and how to tie the plot together. And, and that regularly happens that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of hard to do a lot of research up front when you don't know what the story is, because then your research scope is too big and you would never know when to stop. So for me, I do a very small amount of research. So for example, with the Paris Secret, I knew that I wanted to write about those female air transport auxiliary pilots. So I read one kind of book that summarized the experiences of a number of the pilots. So it was more of a collective kind of approach rather than just one specific person's. Um, and I read Dior's autobiography as well at the same time. So I had those kind of things in my head. And then it was, for me, the first draft is trying to work out what the story is. So I need to focus on the story and the characters and who these people are and how they know each other and what's going to happen to them. And that takes up almost all of my brain space, let alone having to research as well. And so then at the end of this first draft that is literally blood, sweat and tears, I now have what I call my research blueprint. It's full of gaps and places where I've said, you need to find out more about this and, you know, fill this kind of information in here. And so then I go and I take a, a solid month off writing and that's when I go and do research. And normally in a year where travel is possible, that's when I will travel and visit the places that are in my book um, and do a lot more reading. And then I sit down and write the second draft armed with all of that research. So the second draft is um, a big job in terms of pulling in all of that information and making it all authentic and believable and realistic as well as making sure the story works and the characters are complex, et cetera. And then I usually do about three more rewrites. So I'm a much bigger rewriter than first draft or the first draft might take you know, two or three months, but then the rewriting takes many more months after that. Um, and that whole time I'm rewriting, um, I make myself sit down every day for lunch for about 45 minutes and I'll read one of my research books while I'm having my lunch. So I'm researching the whole time I'm rewriting and continually finding new things or making notes of what else I need to research. So I mean, it's about a two year process all up, um, but uh, some of that time you're you know editing another book or um you know doing research so it's not it's not like you're writing and researching the whole time but it takes place over the span of about two years for me um because I I mean I've tried to outline I've tried to plan and it for some reason it just kills the creativity for me I, I um I can't then conjure up the I guess for me part of the interest in writing is to work out what the story is somehow so that's what kind of drives me and then once I have the story it's to try and make it better and if I plan it all up front then I know what the story is so then I don't need to write it in a way um, so whilst I would love to be more organized I resign myself to the fact that I'm not and I just have to accept that that's how it is how about you Kerry are you different same uh, well, I love this idea that you are organized in every other aspect of your life so that you can just like let it go. I don't know, you know, do you write by hand or do you write into the computer? 
Mostly into the computer, but I do write a lot by hand. I have a notebook on my desk with lots of handwritten scribbles, but they're the things that you get when you're, you know, washing the dishes or in the shower or in the car without the kids yelling and screaming at you in the back. Um, so they're all those bits that you kind of scribble down at the muse kind of gift to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I use my, like, I email myself those ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I used to, before I wrote historical fiction, I was a total pantser. Like, that's the other, I think, in young adult world, this, it's instead of, um, what was the other word? What was the word that Mina used? Plotter versus I think pantser. it's a pl planner versus pantser. Pantser. Okay. So I used to be a total pantser writing by the seat of my pants and I could, I, but I wasn't writing historical fiction. So when it came time for me to write my first historical fiction and, and also Grace Kelly, I used them almost the same, um, uh, method, which was I, because maybe because I was writing about a real person, I couldn't do really what you did Natasha, because I didn't know what had happened to them. Yes. <laughs> so I had to do, a lot of research to figure out like what happened and what were the kind of the major events. And so what I do as I'm reading is I, I have, I, I read with my computer open and a mic and a Microsoft word document, which I call timeline. And I, I organize, even, even if I'm not going to necessarily tell the story chronologically, this timeline is a chronological timeline of, of major highlights in the person's life. And it's not necessarily, uh, there's vastly more information in this document than ever winds up in the book. Um, and, you know, this document is usually, you know, like maybe 20 single space pages or something like that. Um, and I, I wind up thinking of it as kind of the outline for the book, sort of s simultaneously an outline and a menu of things that I can include <laughs> or not include. <laughs> I mean, there's some, obviously some major things that you must include, like in the case of Grace Kelly, you know, like her, mo the, the, you know, the Hitchcock movies, her wedding, the yeah. birth dates of her children, you know, so there are some things that we, we, you know, that just have to be in there and they have to be exactly on the date that they happened. Um, but where, the, but, but where the imagination comes in for me is, as I think I was saying earlier, it's sort of like, well, how did she, I need to move her from this movie to the next movie. Like, how did she decide to star and go to, to take the part in High Noon and then take the part in um, Dial M for Murder? Um, she actually, she had a really interesting choice to make um, in her uh, sort of midway in her very short film career, which was she was actually offered the part of Edie Doyle in On the Waterfront opposite Marlon Brando. Um, but, and she had, a, she couldn't do that and Rear Window. So she had to choose, and I, I think it is, and that I really wanted to include this in the book because um, I think it shows so much about her that she, she chose Rear Window over On the Waterfront, especially because um, On the Waterfront had been a play and she was very attracted, she, what she actually wanted to be and what she trained to be was a stage actress. And so to turn down a part that was a movie version of a famous stage play with Alaya Kazan, who was, you know, la um, in his day, was really a pretty big deal for her to, to turn that down. And so I really, and it, for me, it just said a lot about her and I, but I got to decide what it said about her, right? Because there's, there's only, you know, you know, people who have been interviewed, you know, 30 years later about what that choice meant. And so as a fiction writer, I got to decide what it meant for her in the moment. So um, anyway, yeah, that was fascinating. I had no idea that she had been offered the party on the waterfront and, you know, because Marlon Brando, who was so famous at the time, and that must have been so hard for her to choose which one to do. But obviously she made the right choice, didn't she? She, made, so. she for sure made the right choice. Right? She absolutely made the right choice. And um, well, you know, she and Brando had the same film agent at the time. Yes. Um, so I, I don't think that played a role. I mean, I think that, you know, she, you know, they, they wanted, they wanted a, a beautiful blonde in that part and they, they wound up, um, uh, they wound up with Eva Marie Saint. So, um, mm. who did she, I, I actually can't remember if she won an award for that part or not. Anyway, um, the rest is film history. Um, but so, I, so I am now for writing historical fiction, I am a plotter. <laughs> um, but I don't, 
I don't like plot down to the the detail of what's going to happen in every chapter that I could never do because that would for me so the first draft for me is is a real like dance between the chapter document that's open on my computer and that menu timeline I'm like (laughs) Um, but once I get immersed in a scene like that timeline really goes away and I'm just I'm doing exactly what you're doing um, yeah I love the idea of calling it a menu that you can kind of just choose from oh I want this for my main course (laughs) this for my dessert (laughs) um because I guess I mean I have something similar when I'm doing my research I'm writing notes down of all the different events that seem like they might be of interest for me in my story because obviously there's so much in a book about the air transport auxiliary you're not taking notes on everything just the things that you're basically cherry picking out as being the most interesting so I guess I have a bit of a menu too and I really like that when I'm going to call it my menu from now on (laughs) (laughs) well do do you also I guess you do I mean the other thing that I do is even though I do a lot of upfront research um there's a lot of like small research that I do while I'm writing. And sometimes I'll be immersed in a scene and I'll just like leave blanks exactly like you do. That I'll go back and fill things in. But sometimes it'll be the kind of day where it's sort of going slow. And I wind up being like, well, what music would they have been listening to? Um, and I go down a little like hour long, you know, Google rabbit hole about like songs from, you know, 1952, like what would have been playing at the Stork Club, um, you know, and things like that. So do you do also that? And like, do you do that at a later point? No, it depends again, if I am in a scene that I would much rather be distracted from, then I'll go down the Google rabbit hole right then and there. So I have that distraction. So, um, you know, I remember um, spending at least an hour on the intricacies of 1940s underwear because of course it's very different to 2020s underwear Um, so it's all of those small things because you have to get that stuff right especially if you're writing about fashion um so and I just recently I'm writing another book and I was looking at you know the different churches in the town of Bern in Switzerland I mean you know so there are just those small things that um you know you you could just kind of make it up or smooth it over but I don't know I feel like I'd be cheating like I have to go and make sure that it's the right underwear or the right church or the right music or you know it doesn't feel doesn't feel right to just to kind of skim over that and just say they listened to music I need to know what were they listening to yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um it so, sounded um, it like maybe there were some more questions from the audience so yeah um on Facebook Tracy asks and this one comes up a lot lately have you, have you been able to write during COVID? And if so, has it affected your research or your writing ability? So I have been writing during COVID. Um, it's, earlier in the year, it was a little tricky. Uh, I have three kids and they were obviously home from school because the schools weren't open. And my husband wasn't able to go into his office. He was working from home as well. And um, this sounds a little bit strange, but... I love to write in just quiet and have that solitude because with three kids, the house is very noisy most of the time, but when they're off at school and it's just me in my office writing, it's peaceful, it's quiet, and that's the best environment for my creativity. Um, And then suddenly just knowing there are four people in the house, even if they're doing their schoolwork, homeschooling, I just, it changes the energy in the air and it's just not as, I don't know, it it disrupts my creative process in a way. So that was quite challenging. And also, I mean, I couldn't just leave, my son's still in primary school, so I can't just leave him to manage the homeschooling on his own. I did have to go and make sure he was following his schedule and doing all the work and that kind of thing. So um, that was a strange time because it wasn't the nice, peaceful chunk of time when the kids are at school that was finding bits and pieces. But it reminded me a lot of, I wrote my first book um, with a baby. And so I was writing it in the hour and a half where she might have her day sleep. Um, and so it reminded me a lot of that. And it, I just thought, well, I did that once before, so I can just do that again. So long as you can get some words down every day, then you will end up with a book at the end of that. And so that was just what I told myself the whole time. Now over here in Australia, things are much, uh, we're very lucky. There are very few cases of COVID. So life is basically back to normal. So I've been writing uh, a book for 
next year, which I've just sort of finished up. So I've been able to get back into the writing, no problems at all. The research has been challenging. I was scheduled to go to Europe in June and I have not been able to do that. Luckily, the places I'm writing about, Italy, Switzerland and France, I have been to all of those places before. So I can draw on some of those experiences. However, I always, even if I have been to a place before, when you go to it for research purposes, you look for specific things. And so I would have been looking at it with very different eyes if I'd known that I was going to need to draw on those memories a couple of years later to write about them. So I do feel like I'm missing out in some ways. Um, and I'm hoping I can either, uh, this is not for a book till 2022. So I do have some time to you know, see how things transpire and whether I can get back to Europe at some stage prior to 2022. So I haven't kind of given up on that yet, but I'm just doing the best I can with memories, photographs, research sources for now. So that's pretty much how it's been for me. I don't know, how's it been for you, Carrie? You're obviously in the US, so it's very different over there. Than yeah. I mean, so I, I too wrote, you know, when my daughter was very small and when she napped and, and, and actually I really, I got very good. There was a, a whole period of time when I wrote most of my first novel, she was in nursery school and I would drop her off. It was like, you know, it was three hours in the morning. Right. So I would drop her off, come home, make myself a second cup of coffee and be like, I have two and a half hours before I have to get in that car again. Yep. <laughs> and then the rest of my day is hers. Right. And so I just, I, I taught myself during that period of time to really write in these like really intense two to two and a half hour chunks of time. And I too drew on that um, during the spring. Um, you know, so she's actually been home. Um, she, she actually wound up in camp, um, like day outside, you know, masked all masks and day camp. Um, so I was really quite productive in the summer and I turned in, um, a draft of a book that's also coming out in 2020, uh, 2022, that it was, is set in Paris in the twenties but I had already been to Paris for that because for all, I won't repeat what you've said so beautifully. I also, if at all possible, I like to go to the place, um, the places that I was writing about. And, you know, for, I, I did, was so lucky. I got to go to Monaco um, when I was researching the girl in white gloves. And, you know, if I hadn't, there were, there's a, more than one scene in here that wouldn't have existed without me going there and kind of stumbling on things that I, or in seeing things that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Like I could have, I for sure could have done it without going. But if you, it, like, it's just, as you've said, like having boots on the ground and getting to feel, breathe the same air and see the way the light falls in the same way your characters do. It just, it's a special kind of research that if you can do it, it's great. Um, so, but fortunately I had already been able to do that for the book that was, that I was writing and that was due. So, um, and, and now I'm, I'm sort of, I'm poking around at um, for a, a new, another subject. So I'm sort of between projects right now. But, uh, you know, I, I, I have, I've had all the same struggles that any working parents have had, you know, having their kids home with COVID. Like it's, everyone's had to adjust. Um, fortunately, my daughter, um, she's in fourth grade this year and she's, she's done like, she's in a, Americans will all understand this term, this hybrid, she's been doing hybrid school. And yep. even just I, the difference between the end of third grade and the beginning of fourth grade for her has been vast. She's just been so much more independent this fall as a fourth grader. So I'm counting my lucky stars there, but because l l last spring was really very, very challenging. So I have a, um, Oh, go ahead, Natasha. No, no, that's all right, Manny, go. Um, more, have we got some more questions? <laughs> um, I actually have a follow-up question on um, on how you chose your topics. Um, and how do you, you know, Dior and um, Grace Kelly are such well-known, or we feel like we know them so well. Um, obviously, there's a lot to be more that could be known. But how do you tease out what's going to be unique in your story, given that you know, that, that we all feel like we know them so well? I think that with any well-known person, there are a set of facts that are very well known about them. But underneath that set of very well-known facts, there's a whole lot of other stuff that most people don't know because they're seen to be sort of less important. So 
with Christian Dior, for example, most people know that he was the founder of the new look and we know what the new look is and that he had a kind of a short life and that they're the basic facts that people know and he has this you know, name that has gone on with his couture house since the 1940s. But most people don't know that Christian didn't sew. Um, he was never, he didn't come to fashion through that um, that side. He came through it, through it through drawing. He was an architect and then he began to sell sketches to designers like Lucien Lelong in Paris in the 1940s. And he worked for Lucien Lelong as a sketcher, basically making drawing up designs for Lelong because Lelong had this, he was one of the, he was the grand couturier of the 1940s in Paris, but Lelong didn't draw, he sewed, whereas Christian didn't sew, he drew. And so some of Lelong's most famous designs from the 1940s were actually drawn by Christian. Um, and then Christian set up his own couture house. And so he had to have the women around him who could sew and translate his drawings into the actual dresses. So, you know, most people don't know those kinds of facts about Christian and he had these three women around him, Mitza Bricard, Madame Carré and Madame Raymond, who he called his kind of three mothers and they're largely responsible for a lot of what went on behind the scenes at Dior, even though obviously Dior being the namesake got the credit for it. So as a writer, when you're reading things like this, um, you are always looking for those other um, sort of substrata facts, I suppose, that most people don't know about, but are actually incredibly interesting, but somehow they're not the, the famous facts, I suppose, about that particular person. And there are so, usually so many of those things that you can find. And, you know, I mean, you know, Catherine Dior was, uh, I guess, a bit of a, a gift character in a way, because most people that I've spoken to in events like this say, I'd never heard of her, um, had no idea that she he had this sister who did work for the resistance. So she was a complete unknown. So to be able to bring her onto the page and let people know about her remarkable story was, was quite wonderful for me as a writer. So I feel that it doesn't matter who the famous person is, you as a writer are, are in the way that you look at the information about that person, there will always be things that spark off ideas for scenes in your writer's minds. And usually those are the things that add the texture and substance to the main body of knowledge that we have about that person. I don't know, how do you feel about that, Kerry? Yeah, well, and I think, I mean, you know, basically what you're saying is if it's interesting to us, we sort of assume it's going to be interesting to, it's like you were saying about the, you know, you, you would have fallen asleep, bored, silly, <laughs> about like the planes, but actually getting in that plane and seeing and feeling. And so you knew that you were going to be able to write that in a compelling way. And I think that, so the, the things that surprise us are we, I think, we're more, more likely to write about them in a way that is going to surprise our reader also. And, but also, you know, Grace Kelly, th this happened to me a few times with Grace Kelly. Like I, people, I would tell people what I was writing about and be like, oh, Grace Kelly. Um, and they would give me, give me interesting access, sort of accidental feedback that made me realize that the certain things that I wanted to highlight in my book. So for instance, people would, this happened a number of times. Oh, you know, Grace Kelly, didn't she marry a prince? Yes. <laughs> um, wasn't he a lot older than her? And I thought, well, you know, no, <laughs> he was only six years older than her. But I was like, well, why does everyone think that? And it is because all of her male co-stars co were about a quarter of a century older than her. Um, I'll just rattle off a few. So like Bing Crosby was like 26 years older than her. She co-starred with him twice. Clark Gable was, I think, uh, 27 years older than her. No, Gary Cooper was 27 years older. Clark Gable was 25. Jimmy Stewart was the spring chicken of the bunch in Rear Window. He was only 22 years older than her. Cary Grant was I, 24, 25. I used to know these the, the exact numbers, but um, so you'll have to forgive me. But these are all, but they're all within like a year or two ballpark. But this is why everyone thinks that she's married to someone who's so much older than her because all her co-stars were famously so much older than her. And so there was something about her life where like 
you know, the, the, the Grace Kelly persona became more real than reality. <laughs> and I, I became really interested in sort of exploring that um, in my book. And so, and, and I think that was one of the surprises of researching and writing about her, but it, that kind of came from sort of early audience participation, we'll say, um, you know, just chatting with people about her um, and what they knew like what, what do people know about her? And so that was interesting to kind of discover. Right, that there's probably lots of blanks in there and then you can like use your imagination to come up with something that right. would appeal to readers. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, Lisa would like to know if um, you, if uh, Natasha, you have a background in fashion. Um, not a formal background in fashion. I call myself an, an amateur fashion historian because it's just a love that I've had. Um, I lived in London for a couple of years in the 1990s and London at that time had a number of um, vintage fashion stores on the Kings Road and Chelsea, Steinberg and Tolkien being the most famous. And I used to basically spend my Saturday afternoons in there just kind of looking at these racks of gowns from the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s and um, you know thinking oh wow it'd be so wonderful to be able to afford to buy one of those because at that time there's not a chance I could have afforded that um, and I was surrounded by amazing fashion museums like the fashion collection at the v &A Museum, the Fashion Museum at Bath um, and I'm, I'm from Perth, Western Australia, so we don't really have a fashion museum here at all. So to suddenly be in a city like London with all of these amazing, you know, pieces of fashion history around me, I just immersed myself in it. Um, I started collecting books on fashion. I started reading widely about it. And so really from that point on the 1990s, it's just been a love of mine. And so when it came time to write my first historical novel, which came out in 2016, um, that was set in the 1920s and you know the 1920s has got such a definitive kind of style when it comes to fashion and from that moment on I, every time I wanted my character to to get dressed into something I would go and look at all of my books and pull out an actual piece from the 1920s and I would describe the piece so it was not a, a dress that I'd made up it was an actual real live authentic kind of piece and so that was just something I started to do from 2016 and then gradually more and more fashion uh, I began to pull those that into my book in terms of plot lines and storylines because readers seem to really respond to that so no I have no formal fashion training I am this year I've started doing a a fashion illustration course, um, fashion painting and watercolour and acrylics, which I've really enjoyed. Um, I don't know whether you can see behind my head, there's a piece up there on my bookshelf. Um, so that's just been another really nice way to, um, you know, to express myself creatively in a different way. Um, but, you know, I've been really lucky with my research. I've been able to visit fashion ateliers in Paris and sit and watch seamstresses work and all those kinds of things are just wonderful for me. And so that's, I think, part of why I keep including those fashion storylines in my books, because it means I get to have these wonderful research experiences on the side. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Uh, because, because a lot of us don't get that experience. So reading it through your books, um, you know, it just makes us feel like we're there as well. Um, yeah. And so interestingly, both of you have written, uh, have taught writing or in the past or are doing it now. And so one of the questions we have is what made you decide to write historical fiction and what advice pro or con would you give to a writer who's thinking about doing the same? Um, I, so I, I, I love broadcasting this before the Kennedy debutante, I was just, I, I mean, I had an MFA and I had, I had done some writing related things and, um, but I had five, I was a housewife with five unpublished novels in the attic. You know, like I, 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 I stumbled on the, this idea to write about um, John F. Kennedy's younger sister. And I, it was actually a stumbling block for me. I was like, who am I to write about John F. Kennedy's younger sister? Like I'm, I've got, you know, I, but you know, like the, but the, her, she as a subject just kept calling out to me. Like I, I was actually, um, you mentioned, you met, mentioned a couple of times. I, so I wrote, um, 
a, a memoir for young writers called This Is Not a Writing Manual. And I wrote that before I had ever gotten a novel deal. And, and you know, part of like one of the main themes of that book was, you know, I wrote it kind of when I was in my early mid thirties. And, and one of the questions I was asking myself was why write in the absence of the big book deal, right? Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 the real answer to that is, um, uh, you know, very personal to every writer. Um, you know, writers say this all the time um, and it's really the truth, which is you write because you must. <laughs> um, you know, another way of asking the question is, you know, how do you know when you're a writer? And I was like, so this is how you know you're a writer. You're gonna wake up one morning and you're gonna be really cranky. And you're gonna be realize that the reason you're really cranky is because you haven't done any writing. Um, and for some of us, that's two weeks. For some of us, that's two years. So the threshold for this level of crankiness is different for everyone. But as soon as you get back to the writing, you're like, ah, okay, this it's something that I have to be doing to feel like myself, which sounds very woo woo, but it really is the truth. I see Natasha over this. I always feel good when somebody's like, like nodding their head, head yes. And you know, so, and, and how I came to write historical fiction, um, you know, like really the answer was I, I like another one, like I had to, like the subject just kept calling out to me. I had this like secret file on my computer that I would add links to and all this other stuff. It was always like I was hiding it. And I finally just had to like sit down and write it one day and it was the right thing. And all the other books that I had written um, until that point, I had written a romance novel. I had written a serious work of literary fiction. I had written two young adult novels, one of which was a paranormal, a mystery, like all, like dabbling in all of those other genres gave me the tools I needed to write the book that finally sold. So I would say my advice to you out there is be patient, take risks, be on the path and be committed to the path. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, my story is a little bit similar. So I did the equivalent of the MFA here. And as part of that, my thesis was my novel. And because I'd written it at university, it was a serious literary weighty work of fiction, which is what you're supposed to write at university. And um, that won an award and got published, but so that wasn't historical fiction, it was contemporary fiction. And so because I'd written that first book in that style, I wrote a second book in that style, because I just thought that's what you're supposed to do. And that one got published too, sold very small amounts. And then I sat down and wrote a third book in a similar style. And it was the most hideous writing experience I've ever had. I hated writing this book. I literally had to drag myself to my chair every day and make myself put words in the computer. And I got to the end of it and I just thought, oh my God, that I can't bring myself to rewrite this book because I hate it so much. And so I just, deleted it literally threw the whole 85,000 words out and sat in this chair sulking for a month pulling all of my favorite books off the bookshelf and just rereading them because I just I knew I needed some kind of renewal I guess and when I did that I realized that most of my favorite books were historical fiction mm. and I'd had this idea for an historical novel in the back of my head for a while but I had ignored it because that's not what I wrote and I was scared to suddenly tackle something new and different but this kind of sitting here in this chair and reading all of these books made me think well if I don't write what I love you know I'd been writing what I thought that I was supposed to write and what I should write and I'd never stopped to ask myself whether that was the thing I loved most to write whereas at that point in this chair I did I said well what would you love to do and I thought I want to write that idea that's in my head I want to write that historical novel and so I sat down to do that and that was the most joyful fun amazing writing experience I've ever had it was like I found my thing finally so that book um, got published and was much more successful than the previous two and that was really when I started to write historical fiction so I guess just like Carrie said I think my biggest writing tip is, you know, you have to love the idea because you are stuck with it for quite a number of years. So if you don't love it, it's hard to stay the distance. So I think that's really important. And writing is a mix of 
talent, hard work and luck. And you have some control over the first two, how much work you put in and how much you choose to develop your talent by doing writing courses and learning, et cetera. Um, and if you do those two things, hopefully the luck will come along and find you. Um, so that would be you know, my advice, I guess, about that. Thank you. Um, just a last question from Facebook. Um, Natasha, what decade is your favorite in terms of fashion? And I'm going to add on to that. Carrie, what's your favorite era to write about? So favorite decade at the moment, I, well, I've got to say, I am completely obsessed with um, the new look at the moment because the book I'm writing for 2022 goes back to Dior again, but really focuses in on the sort of 1947 year where the new look suddenly became the thing that women wore and it's looking at why that was the case and what effect that had and, and why that happened post wartime, I suppose. And it's a really interesting kind of set of dynamics about women's lives and responsibilities post-war and what happened to women kind of post-war. So the fashion is a big part of that. And so I'm basically spending all of my time with books on my desk with 1940s into 1950s kind of fashion. So that's definitely my favourite era at the moment. It does tend to change depending on what I'm writing. Um, but, you know, give me a Dior 1950s ball gown and I'm a pretty happy girl. <laughs> I mean, did you, were there any gowns of braces that you found in your research that you just thought, oh my God, that is the most spectacular thing, Kerry? Well, you know, it's the one where she, in that first scene in Rear Window, it's that black ba ballet neck. It was Edith Head. It was an Edith Head concoction. It was a black ballet neck top with that frothy white tulle skirt that just goes out absolutely just out to there with, and it has like a beautiful, like black beading, like I could stand up and like goes like the beating goes down to here. <laughs> anyway, and you know, she's wearing, you know, her black pumps and her heels. It's just like the epitome of Grace Kelly like that. I mean, and that's not, and, and that's not why I love it. I love it because it's perfection and, and it's perfect. And, and, the reason it's become like the epitome of the Grace Kelly look is because it was so perfect on her. It just, she just wore it so beautifully. Um, anyway, so, but um, my favorite era to write about, I mean, you know, just like you said, it changes with, you know, what, what I'm writing about. I mean, like, but sort of the inverse, I guess, is also true. Like, if you would, if you had told me 10 years ago that I was going to write a book set during World War II, I would have said, get out of town. <laughs> like, because I just wasn't, I am not like one of these World War II, like buffs, you know, like, you know, I've now read quite a number of fabulous novels set during World War II and I enjoy them thoroughly. But if you had told me that I was gonna write one, I would have said you were crazy. But I did in, in the Kennedy debutante because the character told me that I had to. <laughs> um, and you know what? I had a great time there. I had much more fun, you know, researching and writing about that time period than I ever thought I would. So it, I, you know, I love to be surprised by the process. Oh, that's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're about out of time. I just want to ask one last question, um, which is you had both mentioned what you've written that's coming out in 2022. Could you tell us a little bit about those books? Sure. So I might talk about my 2021. I've got one coming out next year as well, because that one's probably easier for me to talk about. Um, so that's going to be called The Riviera House. So it's set on the French Riviera, as the title would suggest. So very near Monaco, Kerry. Um, in fact, the contemporary storyline takes place entirely on a, on a little French town called St. John Cap Ferrat on the Riviera, which is a beautiful town. And I loved spending some time there doing some research. So it, most of my books are about... Um, women doing something kind of quite extraordinary for their time in history. So the historical storyline centers around um, some women working to protect and to save artworks from the Nazis in Paris during the Second World War. Um, and it's threaded through with this contemporary storyline set in St. John Cap Ferrat. So it was lots of fun to write and um, I'm really looking forward to that one coming out next year. Oh, it sounds thrilling. Um, so mine is, is scheduled to come out in um, early 2022, and it is about Sylvia Beach, 
um, the American woman who in 1919 opened the original Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris, um, which was the only uh, first and only English language bookstore and lending library in Paris. And it was the home of the lost generation writers. So, you know, Ernest Hemingway, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, they all went there. And um, it was really their home away from home. Um, so it was this fabulous literary milieu. But she also, um, something that the thing that, one of the things that most people don't know about her is that she, in 1922, so we're coming up with a centennial, she published the original first edition of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, after it had been banned and convicted of obscenity in New York in 1921. So um, the story of Ulysses winds up getting um, sort of threaded through her story also. So it's a Paris, Paris between the wars. Can't wait, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> that sound, both of them sound fantastic. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. This has been unbelievable. I've learned so much about so many different things. <laughs> um, and I do wanna, Remind everybody that they can buy books from Natasha and Carrie from uh, Porter Square Books. Find books are gold. And um, I hope you've learned as much as I have and enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so, so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much for having us. And thanks, Carrie. That was lots of fun. <laughs> so much fun. Let's do it again. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to be invited to that. <laughs> thanks everybody for being here and your wonderful <laughs> questions. Thanks everybody on um, Facebook who joined us. This is really special. Thanks again. Thanks. So bye everyone. Bye. bye, -bye.